Nice. So welcome everybody to the uh, teachings, the uh, commentary, traditional commentary of Vajogini. Um, please do turn off your video because our bandwidth here is good, but it's not good enough if everybody has video on. Well, so we wait for a few moments for <clears throat> starting the prayers. Uh, please spend some time in your motivations. Okay, so I'm going to start now. Um, there is traditional uh, prayers we do at the start of the teachings, but uh, it's been a very busy weekend and we haven't been able to print all of the prayers that we have to do to start the actual teaching. So uh, tonight we're just going to do uh, refuge and we're going to then do the mandala offering um, in the future nights. Uh, because this is traditional, we'll do uh, the heart sutra and a variety of other things. So again, feeling that uh, you're in the mandala of Vajogini. All of the great Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are around you, Haruka, Medicine Buddha, Tara. You all see yourself in the aspect of Vajogini, but without your implements. We would love to offer a more enlightened relationship for the benefit of all. And that's why we're attending the teachings of Vajogini. So um, I'll do refuge, uh, do a prayer that I have from English. Uh, please do your own appropriate prayer. And feeling that you're being observed in the statement that you're making about yourself by Haruka and Vajogini. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha from now until enlightenment. I'll work for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be happy. I go for refuge to the Dharma Sangha from now until enlightenment. I'll work for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be happy. I go for refuge to the Buddha Dharma Sangha from now until enlightenment. I'll work for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be happy. Offering the mandala, please. <coughs> please lead. Before the feet of the Guru, non different from the main deity, I present this offering to the Buddha fields as a gift to request by entering into the mandala of the Supreme Vajra Yogini. Om Vajra Bhumi Ahum, here is the mighty and powerful golden vase. Om Vajra Reke Ahum, in the center of the iron mountain stands Meru, the king of all mountains. To the four directions, the sub directions are the four continents and subcontinents. In the east is the treasure mountain, in the south, the wish granting tree, in the west, the wish granting cow, in the north, the <coughs> harvest. Here is the precious wheel, here is the precious jewel, here is the precious consort, here the precious minister, here is the precious elephant, here the precious and best of horses, here is the precious general, and here the great treasure vase. Here is the goddess of play, here the goddess of garlands, here the goddess of song, here the goddess of dance, here is the goddess of perfume, here the goddess of flowers, here the goddess of incense, and here the goddess of light. Here is the sun, here is the moon, here is the umbrella of all that is precious, and here the banner of victories in all directions. 
Here in the center are all the possessions precious to God's name. This magnificent collection, lacking in nothing, I offer to the Buddha fields as a gift to request you, O glorious and holy, kind root and lineage gurus, to be allowed to enter into the mandala of the sublime of Yukini. In your compassion, I request that you accept this offering for the sake of all beings, and after accepting, I request as well that through your great compassion, you send forth waves of inspiring strength to all sentient beings, including myself. By directing to the fields of Buddhas this offering of a mandala built on a base resplendent with flowers, saffron, water, and incense, adorned with Mount Meru and the four continents, the sun and moon, may all sentient beings be led to these fields. Send forth to me waves of inspiring strength, so that after training on the common paths and becoming a proper vessel, I might easily enter into the holy vehicle for those of good fortune, the Vajra vehicle, which is the supreme of all vehicles. Om Idam Guru Atla Mandala Kamniriya Tayani. Okay, so uh, welcome to the teachings of Vajragini. Uh, this will be a seven-day presentation. Uh, we'll talk. We'll teach for approximately an hour. We'll have a small break so that you can uh, relax a little bit, and then we'll possibly teach for another hour. Um, in uh, I originally attended these teachings in 1973 in Sarnath, and it was with uh, Tri Chung Rinpoche and about 500 monks and nuns, actually. Uh, so and so at that point uh, I didn't I could read Tibetan but I couldn't do much more than that so I received the full transmission and then from that day I had to start doing the long sadhana every day uh, and it was it took several years before I got all the uh, teachings on that but I didn't maintain my commitment of the uh, the sadhana the mantras and such so as a teacher uh, for the teacher of this particular tantra I did receive the original transmission from Tri Chung Rinpoche uh, later I received commentaries from Geshe and Darge, Sirkin Rinpoche uh, and then also some commentaries from uh, Nemo Lochen Rinpoche uh, and then I in another date uh, I, I was the both the translator and the uh, and the student for a Luden Ken Rinpoche of the Sakya lineage. And although uh, this, this will be a Galupa transmission coming from Mulcher Dhamma Bhatra, <coughs> uh, and of course with some from Pabanka Rinpoche, but I do have that full lineage uh, and such. And then again, uh, in 2000, I was in India and with Kalka Jetson Dampa, who is the uh, Mongolian Dalai Lama uh, with about 40 of us from the West. Uh, we again received the full transmission of initiation and transmission of Bajyogini. Uh, this was uh, solely with the uh, Mulcher Dhamma Bhadra uh, lineage. So, uh, and then of course, I've done retreats many times. I've done the ritual, fire rituals. Uh, I have permission from His Holiness the Dalai Lama to give initiations. Um, he gave me that in 1988. Uh, and then with an FPMT, I do have permission to uh, teach uh, the Vajrayogini uh, Tantra. So uh, from the side of a teacher, this is my qualifications. Uh, from the side of students, of course, you have to receive the initiation. So uh, uh, at this point, it's live, and I know all of you have received the initiation. But uh, for those of you, maybe later, if you watch this on YouTube, somehow you got the link. Um, please, if you haven't got the initiation, don't watch this. It's not appropriate. Um, if you're really interested, go find the initiation. Now, um, I'm going to pause periodically because it has been translated into Spanish <laughs> and I was a translator for many years, so I don't want to stress my translator. <laughs> okay, so uh, now the first today, um, I'm going to review uh, the history for you of the uh, Vajrayogini Tantra, the great practitioners of the Vajrayogini Tantra. And then and, and and tomorrow we'll start the actual, uh, the 11 yogas. And, and this is appropriate, it's important to be inspired about the great practice of Vajrayogini. So the, uh, originally the, the practice of, of this practice comes within the uh, Tantra of Karuka Chakra Sambara. And so uh, it said a long time ago, um, Shiva and Prabhati or Shiva and Kalaratri, or also called Bhairava, um, 
uh, were sort of dominating the world, and uh, in, in particular in the country of India, uh, with you know basically delusions being uh, you know encouraged and such. And so Buddha Shakyamuni, in his compassion, decided that this could be changed. And so uh, both Shiva and Parvati were away from uh, their, 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 in the Himalayas where they had their, uh, their palace, their mandala. And so Buddha Shakyamuni uh, manifested the Haruka Chakra Sambara, the full aspect of Haruka, uh, four faces, 12 arms and such. And, uh, and in union with, uh, with Vajra, uh, with uh, uh, Vajra, Vajra Yogini and such. And they were radiating great light. And of course, at that point then, uh, Shiva or Bharava and uh, 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 Kalaratri or Bravati sort of saw this and became like a frame. Who is, who is in our palace and who is radiating great light? And so as they charged towards or rushed towards, uh, towards uh, Buddha Shakyamuni and the aspect of Haruka Chakras and Bara, um, they were transformed by the light and the purity and the radiance. And, uh, and that way then uh, they absorbed into and became the Haruka Chakra Sambara uh, Vajrayogini uh, and that. And then all of the 24 sacred places in India, uh, they all were transformed also and became under the, let's say, well, un under the practice of the uh, of Haruka Chakra Sambara. And so that was the uh, start of it. And then the unique thing is, is that, uh, you know, in those days, I mean, Buddha Shakyamuni was a Buddha. He could manifest anything he wanted. And he manifested the full mandala of Haruka Chakra Sambara. And then within that gave the initiations to appropriate students, but never withdrew it. All the other great tantras, the mandala was manifested, it was bestowed, and then Buddha Shakyamuni absorbed it back into his heart. Whereas in this case, it was not. So it said that the uh, practice of the Haruka Tantra is unbelievably precious and special, and actually the mandala created by the concentration, the power of Buddha Shakyamuni still exists in this world. So it's a very precious Tantra. We should be really quite excited. Can I move the microphone closer to you? Because we're getting a lot of uh, low, so it'll pick up your voice more clearly. Sure. Is that all right? Slight uh, technical adjustment. Yeah. <coughs> Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So hello again. <laughs> okay. Anyway, now then the Haruka Tantra, uh, the, it, it is, um, it, it's come, I, sorry, I have you know, notes basically because it's a lot of information that has to be shared. So the root Tantra has 51 chapters. And in the 51 chapters, there's 14 key points that were taught about how to practice this Tantra. So, for example, there's one is the attire, the, the way that Haruka and Vajrayini dress. There's the five mudra ornaments. Uh, then there's the wisdom limbs, which is the, the teachings of the understanding. The dagger, the, uh, the, <coughs> the vajra uh, floor, sense, and roof. The vowels and consonants. Uh, the causes and the, uh, uh, the, all the causes for the practice of the tantra within the understanding of voidness. Uh, then the, the nada, the, the, the you know, crescent moon, nada, and dot. Uh, the yogas of absorption, that means taking death as dharmakaya. Uh, the nectar that satisfies. Then the dissolutions through the eight visions at the time of death. Hand offering. Uh, and actually, there's a, a teaching by Lama Zopa about the hand offering of Haruka. Uh, and the initiation. Uh, protection of the great arma, which is the, the syllables in the flesh of Vajrayogini and also actually in Haruka Chakra Zambara. Uh, worshipping with mantras. So these then are the 14 essential points of the Haruka Tantra. And the unique thing is that in the, you know, if you practice the Haruka Tantra, it's very, very elaborate. Um, there's a simple version, five deities, or it's, yeah, it's called the five deities of Haruka, or of, of Haruka. And then there's the uh, the extensive one with more than 62 deities in it, and they, they reside all around your body. And that's a very extensive Tantra. Um, it was given in many times in Dharamsala. I was present, but I never received that because it was too difficult. Even the Tibetans that, that did get it, it had two hours worth of recitation. So it's a really extensive Tantra. But the unique thing is that all of that was condensed down into Vajrayogini. One deity, very simple, uh, not too complicated. So the Vajrayogini Tantra is considered 
so precious and special because it's the essence, the sort of the quintessential essence of the, um, of the Heruka Tantras. So if you were to practice the large extensive version, you have deities you generate in your forehead, your eyes, your ears, your nose, uh, your teeth, uh, all over your body. But with the Vajogini, you do them in the heart, in the, in the, the root. I, I explained a little bit, uh, something which I think is quite interesting, that when you, when you look at the Heruka Tantra, what you have is, is that there's, you know, from the heart chakra, uh, you know, the indestructible dot, then all of these veins sort of manifest out and they go to these various parts of your body and then you consecrate them and, and see them as deities and you do mantras and such. But when you look at actually the development of a fetus, that, okay, first there's this meeting of the semen and ovum, uh, then there's slowly the development and it becomes sort of like a potential human. And then in the sixth week comes a heartbeat. And then from there, over the next, you know, I guess seven and a half, eight months, uh, then there's a development of the whole body you know, which then, you know, becomes the head, the ears, the nose, eyes, uh, hands, fingers, all of the details. And so when I, I was thinking, and I'm, I'm just sharing this because uh, I, I was intrigued, that really the Heruka Tantra is talking about the genetics that make us a human and give us all of the various facets of our body. And so when you do the Vajogini Tantra, you go back all the way to the heart chakra and to that heart of a six week old fetus. And then from there then comes all of the, the aspects of who you are. So it said the root of all of the nerves that create all the places in your body that you would bless come from the heart chakra. And that would seem to be a, a coincide to some extent with the development of a fetus into a child. So I, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a you know, I'm not, not knowledgeable of these things, but all I can say is it seems very interesting uh, in the Heruka Tantra, both Heruka and Vajogini, that it seems to relate to some extent to our genetics and DNA uh, and the development of our body, and that working on those nerves and channels, then we can uh, cause great transformation. So it's just that's not part of any commentary Trichar and Poche shared, but it certainly is one that with a, a modern research we can sort of look at. So the, uh, this, this particular Tantra has a variety of things. It has uh, three unique characteristics and four uh, infallible qualities. The unique characteristics, it's a great collection of, of both Sutra and Tantra. So the first uh, of the three characteristics, it's a collection of all the Sutra and Tantra. Um, I've heard said that some people say they practice Tantra uh, because, you know, it's, it's unique. You don't have to practice the Sutra. You're just going for the, the jugular of, 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 you know, of what's important. But that's ridiculous. You know, I, I explained again that, you know, if you do a lot of, you know, nerve meditations, you know, for example, Tumo or Psychic Heat or Kundalini, uh, whatever name you care to give to it, you can create a lot of power and you can affect people in their consciousness as possible. But it doesn't mean that you're a nice person. It's just that it's the, the human body has these potentialities of these attainments, but doesn't guarantee things go well. So in, the, in our tradition, we are uh, bodhisattva tantra practitioners. So therefore we should, we put everything in the context of wisdom and compassion or wisdom and bodhicitta. And that's so important because uh, like I explained, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama, for example, when he gives teachings and talks and things, it has huge effect and impact on you. Or maybe some other teachers you've had, uh, whether it was uh, older teachers or the new teachers now. And what it is is that they, they've, they, they have these psychic abilities. They, they've, they've worked on themselves. They've opened their central channels and such. And so it's like they get larger and larger speakers, like, a, you know, music speakers, like a, like a rock band speakers, okay? But because they have wisdom and compassion, symphony music comes out of those, beautiful music, 
all of the great teachings, spiritual determination, uh, you know, refuge, how to deal with delusions, bodhicitta, nature of reality. So the, uh, that, that's, that's, the, that's the difference between just practicing, you could say kundalini yoga or some yoga for power or even qigong in the Chinese tradition and doing it with bodhicitta and sunyata. I'm, I've heard stories of, in China that the great Qigong masters, they can, they can be in a stadium of 20,000 people and they can do their qi and the whole of the audience feels the, the shifting of that energy. I mean, that, that's, that's your, you know, whether you call Kundalini or Tumo or whatever, it's, it's that. But they can also be very egocentric. No bodhicitta, no wisdom of the nature of reality. So what's very special is that we are in the Buddhist tradition. It is about love and compassion. We are in the bodhisattva vehicle, working for the benefit of sentient beings. So therefore, uh, the sutra and tantra, where well, the first quality or characteristic of the teaching is that it has all of the sutra teachings and it has all of the tantric teachings in this practice. So it's very good. And as I said earlier, you know, the, the, all of the sutra teachings when you bring them to Tantra, it just means you personify them. You know, death and impermanence is the skulls and the bones and such as you wear. Uh, the, the ornaments is the six perfections. There's all these details. So uh, that's the, the first quality. It has all of the te tech things that are necessary in Sutra and Tantra. It is Buddhist practice. Uh, the second one is that it's easy to practice. And that refers particularly to Vajrayogini. As I said, the Haruka practice, you can do the five deities of Haruka, or you can do the uh, 64, 62, 64 deities of Haruka, um, uh, those things, but they're so elaborate, it took hours and hours. Vajrakini is just one deity, one face, two arms, very symbolic, very powerful, so, so easy to practice. And then they put it into 11 yogas. So, so easy to, to go and to organize yourself around them, you know? And it's yoga of sleep, yoga of wake, tasting nectar, then the immeasurables, then guru yoga, then the, uh, you know, taking uh, transformation, uh, then blessing sentient beings and recitation of mantra. So, oh, that's it's so easy to practice. And uh, great goals can be achieved because, you know, again, regular sutra or Buddhist practice if you think about it, it's working with attitude. You know, you change your attitude from being materialistic to being spiritual. You know, what's important, you know, for example, at the time of death, the quality of who you are or the possessions you have and the things, the people in your life. You know, at the end of our life, we're only left with what we did with those things. So if we practice generosity, then we have that quality at the end of our life. Or if we've been wise, helpful, and thoughtful with our friends at the end of our life, and it's sad to die, but we're left with good feelings that I, I was a good person in these people's lives. I was a benefit. <clears throat> and then finally, with our own body, we didn't just have vanity and pride and arrogance and such. We used your body in a good way. So as you, you lie in your deathbed, you could say, good job, body. You did good. Just rebirth. Thank you. So, I mean, these are, this is the, uh, the, 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 the things that the Tantra can help you have clarity about the, the, what is meaningful and what is not meaningful. So great goals can be attained because it is a mixture of Sutra and Tantra, because it is easy to practice and because it can bring great results. And particularly again, so the Sutra practice is like a massage on your attitude. You know, you take your attitude, you try to make it virtuous, you try to have principles, you have inspiration from Buddha Dharma Sangha. You know, then you have the six perfections and how to deal with delusions. So it's all but it relates on attitude. When you move to Tantra, it's based on nerves and channels, still with attitude, but it's much more powerful. So I said it's it's like acupuncture. You know, rather than just a general massage of your body, you get the particular nerve points. You stimulate particular organs and cause a much faster healing. 
the the actual example i mean you know i've, I've got your ear now <laughs> is that uh geshe darge used to give this example he said oh you know this the practice of tantra is like if you're going to kill a buffalo you can beat it all over that's like sutra but if you just cut its throat you kill it quickly that's tantra <laughs> and i thought that was pretty gross <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> you know, I guess you could say, but the buffalo of ignorance or something, but, uh, you know, and you beat it up or whatever, where I, I think my example of, of a massage versus acupuncture is a little bit more clean. <laughs> anyway, you know, there's lots of interesting examples. Um, I'll give you another one. You know, um, they often talk about, you know, the world is an illusion by a magician who creates smoke and smoke and mantras and such. Well, all we need to do is go to a 3D movie. You know, you have your glasses on and the shark comes right out of the screen and goes over the top of your head and goes back in and it feels so real. You know, you lift the glasses up and it's not. You put the glasses on. That's exactly the way you should see reality. In the Lama Chopa, in the, uh, in the verses of the graduated path after you've done it, that's Guru Puja in English or Lama Chopa. You know, and it says, first is that you should appreciate all the phenomena are not contradictory. The mundane aspect of interdependence and continuity, cause of karma, and the ultimate nature of reality are not contradictory or unrelated. They're completely in harmony with each other. Subversive Nagarjuna. Then it says, uh, the second one is you see all phenomena as illusions. So like a, an image reflected in the lake. You know, it's like when you look in a clear lake, dark at night, and you see the moon, it looks like almost you could go down into another realm and there's the moon there and such. That's a, an illusion. Uh, but that's the way we should see all phenomena, but don't exaggerate them into something that they're not. That's the, the taking an illusion and exaggerating it and believing in it. Whereas we should see everything as like an illusion. It's not an illusion, it's like an illusion created by causes and circumstances. So again, I mean, the example of the Tibetans, which is good, uh, is for us is a 3D movie. You know, you look at it, you can feel so much like the things are going to happen to you. You lift up the glasses and immediately it's gone, like the illusion uh, is gone. So with our ignorant mind, the glasses of ignorance, we look at things and we think they're so real and independently existent and existing from their side when we lift up the glasses of our ignorance, we appreciate they're not. They're just a dynamic of causes and circumstances and such uh, empty of self-existence. Anyway, so again, uh, so the, the, all of the sutra teachings are a massage for your mind. And then the tantric, te um, so the tantric teachings are like acupuncture, sort of so powerful. Okay, so when I was talking about examples, and uh, over the next seven days, I'll talk about quite a few things. Um, I think it's very interesting as time passes that the uh, teachings, uh, the words that are used, sometimes are completely wrong, you know, translation, you know, and it's because they were translated by first Jesuit priests. And then we have Christian, you know, background sort of thing. So even if you take the word renunciation, it's not, the, it's not the Tibetan word. You could say spiritual determination. So why? Okay, well, um, for example, I am going to renounce coffee. I put coffee behind me. I'm not going to touch coffee. I renounced it. Okay. What the, the real word, ne jung, is to go forward. So it's not about what you've left behind. It's where you're going with yourself. So arising and going forward. I think the word I like is spiritual determination. So we, the first thing, it could be seen as renunciation. It's translated so often like that. But the real meaning is determination, spiritual determination. I'm going forward. It's not I'm looking backwards. So there's a one. Then uh, if you take uh, ignorance, again, it's so common. Uh, I'm, I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, but in the Tibetan language, it's rikpa or marikpa. Rikpa is to understand. Ma rikpa is you don't understand. So if you look at it, the root of the word for the Tibetans is that there's intelligence, but you put ma and it's not intelligent or not understanding. You can't do that with the word ignorance. 
doesn't work. You could say understanding, not understanding. But the point is, it may, it's a difference. It's not like you are going to stop being ignorant and somehow become I don't know, enlightened ignorance or something. No, you see, the words don't match. Whereas in, in for, so for us in English, it'd be much better to say, you know, I understand, I don't understand. I don't understand things are impermanent. I don't understand things have a continuity of causes and circumstances. I don't understand things are interdependent. I don't understand things are empty of self-existence. Or I do understand. Anyway, these are just thoughts. Um, I, I'm sharing this because we are, most of us are quite serious Buddhist practitioners. And it's good to maybe realign some of our ideas. Another one, which uh, I often hear, and it's used by some Tibetan lamas I know, is the ego. You know, and even Lama Yeshi did it. Um, you know, the, Lama Yeshi was one of my first teachers, incredible siddha. He was really a powerful siddha, great realizations. When one of his students in the very early years would come to him and be crying about some problem, he would grab them, hug them, and say, oh, ego broken. <laughs> so sweet, you know, and it's so meaningful. Like, what it, what it is is, you know, your 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 egocentric, you know, expect with lots of expectation sort of mind. When something goes wrong, broken ego, broken. So it, that way, it was quite well said. But you know, if you think about it, we can't say that the Buddha has an enlightened ego. I, I know all of you are going to go, "Ee, that sounds horrible." You know, it doesn't sound right, does it? So again, another thing, I just think sense of self. You know, I have a sense of self that doesn't understand. I have an enlightened sense of self. And even the word sense of self has facets to it. So it's not like ego is sort of like some thing. Sense of self is more dynamic. I talk about all of this because it is part of the, the you know, Sutra and Tantra. Uh, I think it's important that we, we review some of the things. Uh, some of the teachers are more... Uh, more realizing some of these things. Anyway, three characteristics. It is got both sutra and tantra, easy to practice, and you can get uh, quick realizations. <coughs> okay, then we move to the four infallible qualities. Okay, the four infallible qualities of this particular tantra. First, it comes from Guru or Buddha Vajra Dara. Of course, we also say Buddha Vajra Dharma. It's the same, same same entity. Um, sometimes people get confused with, with that. It's just like you could say the Buddha Vajra Dara changed the color, changed his color. He became Buddha Vajra Dharma. Um, there is some small uh, changes in the visualization, but basically it all comes from Buddha Vajra Dara, Buddha Vajra Dharma. It's got a very, very powerful lineage coming from, of course, Buddha Shakyamuni. So that's the first very special uh, quality of it, uh, very special, unique. Uh, it's infallible teachings transmitted. Uh, so it has what's called a long transmission line. Uh, it means coming from Buddha Shakyamuni when he uh, transformed uh, you know, Shiva and Parvati. And it comes down, of course, then through great, many great Mahasiddhas, practitioners down to the present day. Uh, so it's got a living lineage. It's a long lineage. You know, if it really didn't work, it wouldn't be around 2,000 years later. So long lineage, very good. It also has what's called short lineage. For example, you may be familiar in the Yamantaka Tantra that there's the long lineage coming from Buddha Shakyamuni, Lalita Vajra, but also Tsongkhapa, because Tsongkhapa had a direct vision of Yamantaka. So it's called the long and the short lineage. Uh, so we can say the same thing for the Vajravini practice, the long lineage from Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, the shorter lineage coming from Naropa, and then other great yogis. Then the, uh, so that's the second one, long and short. It's infallible teachings uh, from Naropa. That's actually called the short lineage. And that was, you know, I, I want to talk about that a little bit because it helps you understand the practice. You know, sometimes you think, oh, I can practice this, you know, I do the exercises and I will have realizations. But it's not that, it's who you are. You know, so you take Naropa, okay, so there's a story. So please relax, enjoy, you know, it's, I'm going to tell you nice stories, allow your imagination to think of it. 
So a uh, long time ago, I mean, wherever it is, so a thousand years ago, uh, Naropa was the abbot of the Nalanda Monastery, <coughs> one of the, the gates of Nalanda Monastery. And he was very good at it. He was really smart. He would defeat everyone. He'd become the abbot, you know. So he went up to the top of a mountain or you know, a hill outside of the monastery and was sitting there in sunshine, reading the uh, Perfection of Wisdom Sutra and such, just chanting away and things like that. And then an old woman came up that had these things, 37 marks of ugliness. You know, I, I mentioned this in the initiation, but allow your imagination to be there, you know? So an old woman, she's got a hunchback. She's only got one tooth. Her eyes are, you know, things. She's got a nosebleed. You know, she's drooling, uh, you know, all of the things that you might ever think about. And she's got a stick, you know, and she, she comes up beside Naropa and she says, oh, hey, sunny boy, what you doing? And he says, I'm reading the perfection of wisdom. She goes, oh, so good. You know, you're such a good boy. You know, I love you so much. You know, and she danced around a little bit. You know, and he was like, yes, I'm pretty good, aren't I? You know, I'm not the abbot. You know, and then she, she, she recovered her breath, you know, because she mostly had TV or something too. Anyway, and then she says, and do you understand? And he said, yes. And then she had another epileptic fit, you know, on the ground, frothing and kicking around and everything and freaked completely out Naropa, you know, blew him away. And so he finally calmed her down. He says, he says, why were you happy when I said I was reading, but then you had an epileptic fit when I said I understood? And she says, because you don't, you should meet my brother. And poof, she disappeared in, a, in a, a rainbow and he fainted. And when he woke up, he realized that he was, you know, like out of touch with reality. And if you go to the uh, praise of seeing the beautiful face of the Dakini, it says again and again that you know, she is the deep nature of your mind. And so the, the example is, you know, and I think it was at, uh, Gong, uh, it, uh, <coughs> one of the translators made, made mention of that, that the old woman was a sign of the ugliness of his own soul, that it, he didn't really have a, you know, access to the pure nature of his own soul. Anyway, so in the Naropa completely said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm missing the mark. You know, I just had a visit from a divine lady, you know, but really ugly. <laughs> so um, he gave up his monastery role and started wandering in India uh, and such like that. And it said at one point he was uh, walking in the mountains uh, and such. Uh, actually, uh, close to Dharamsala, Dharamsala, there's a place called Tilopur which is said that maybe Tilopa lived there and there's even a Tibetan nunnery there now. But anyway, who knows? So anyway, so Naropa was walking in the mountains on a, on a skinny trail and he came across a leper woman on the, on the pathway lying and she was blocking him. And he said, oh, you know, so he pulled his robes up and tried to jump over him, over her. Anyway, and as he was in the air, she reached up, grabbed his leg and <clears throat> he fell down in a, in a crash on the ground. And then she says, you have too many expectations. And she disappeared into space. And again, Naropa was like, oh, you know, I'm, I've blown it. You know, again, I met the Dakini and I, my preconceived conceptions got in the way. So really, I mean, he was, you could say his, his soul was talking to him. You know, Bajogini was talking to him, but uh, he, he wasn't able to perceive it. Anyway, then we all know the story that finally ended up, he came across Tilopa, uh, a beggar, you know, on, on, on the side of a river, uh, cooking fish live, you know, and he came up and he said, like, this is, this is, this is Naropa, this is, or Tilopa, this, this is the, uh, the brother of the, the first old lady I met, you know, I mean, this is the Mahasiddha, but, you know, God, he's, he's, he's eating live fish, you know, he's, he's cooking live fish in a fire, you know, I mean, completely shaking his, 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 his conceptions. Anyway, and so, um, you know, then I think it was a uh, Tilopa just you know, snapped his fingers and the fish flew into the sky and disappeared in rainbow lights and stuff like that. And he says, you know, you have a problem and then you know, whatever. And then we know he spent 12 years uh, with uh, Tilopa going through many hardships. So all of this then was the purification, you could say, of his view. You know, he, he was very wise. He was a very good meditator, but he wasn't in touch with his soul, with his, his, his Buddha nature, with the profound nature. And such. So finally, anyway, he did have a direct vision of, of Vajrayogini. You know, he received that and he had all the teachings. He gave it to the Nepalese brothers, the Pumpkin brothers and such. But the point being is that it wasn't wise and it wasn't concentration. It was being in touch with your profound nature. You know, well, you can say, I like to say your soul. I'm, 
I, I heard recently Bob Thurman uh, was talking with the Dalai Lama, and they agreed that you could word, use the word soul. The two of them agreed, or Dalai Lama agreed, because Bob had the idea. And in that, then, <clears throat> the point would be as though we, we translate it differently, though it's not like given by God or something. Uh, it's our nature. It's our profound nature. But again, words are important. You know, why? Because if I say, you know, I mean, because of our culture, I say it's your soul, you sort of have an idea of something deep and profound. Whereas if we say your Buddha nature, it has meaning, of course, but sometimes it can be a bit lighter. So anyway, I'm just saying that it's in our culture, sometimes <coughs> certain words have meaning. Anyway, so uh, Naropa had a direct vision of Ajogini uh, and then gave the teachings. It was transmitted through a variety of students, but particularly with the Pumping Brothers. And if you go into Nepal, there's just uh, the whole of the Nepalese Valley and the Buddhists is all Vajrayogini practitioners. A little different than the way they do it in Tibet. <coughs> uh, and then you have, then you have, of course, it came to Tibet through the Sakyapa lineage and came down finally to being part of the Galupa lineage and such. So that, that's that. Um, then there are other stories, for example, uh, Nakpopa, or uh, Krishnakara, I think is, is the other thing. He has a lineage of the Heruka practices and such, and even the practice of Vajrayogini. Uh, so it said uh, he was down towards, I guess, Vanaras or somewhere in the river Ganges, you know, like that. And there's a place where you could cross over in a shallow, shallow water. And so they, they, they were thinking, it was said that uh, he had the psychic power to be able to uh, levitate all of his students. And it was a question of that he had to, you know, beat his drum and ring his bell and say some prayer. And then all of his students would rise up and they can sort of fly. I guess it was like a, a jet liner or something like that. Anyway, so he had great miraculous power. But anyway, so one day he would, they were walking up to a river. You know, I guess it, you know, hadn't bought the airplane tickets or something. Anyway, so he came up to the river and there was a leper woman sitting there and she says, please carry me across the river. And he, and he thought, and this it said, you know, it said, it said I'm in front of all my students. I can't do that, you know. This is be, be inappropriate. So he just sort of ignored her and walked across the, in the shallow water. Anyway, uh, then uh, a little bit later, then there's a, a student, I think Kusli, but I'm not sure the name exactly. Uh, he came along and he, he was part of you know, Krishnakar's entourage, but he had compassion to the little woman. So he picked her up and they started to cross the river, you know, and they get about halfway across the river and there's a little island. Uh, they're a little bit of a sandbar or something like that and, and stuff. And then they get to that and then suddenly the woman turns into Vajrayogini, grabs him and poof, they go off into space. And then there's a, like those fireworks, this big poof, you know, things, you know, and Krishna Kara or not Popa turns around and goes, shit. <laughs> so he blew it because of, you know, uh, in, in, you know, just his arrogance or his, his pride. So anyway, the, uh, the, the short lineage, uh, the third quality is that it's from the short lineage coming from Europa and from many great practitioners. Um, uh, there is the commentary from Gelek Rinpoche, which is very large, it's just full of uh, stories. I, I highly recommend reading it because Gelek Rinpoche really uh, shared a lot of the, 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 the history and the, the details of the Vajrayogini practice in a very, very precious way. And he was very close to uh, Tri Rinpoche and Ling Rinpoche. Uh, I met him in, in India, I think in 1984 uh, and such. And he, he, uh, was very kind to me, but I, I somehow didn't have the karma connection with him, so I went back to Canada. Anyway, so that's the uh, third thing. So uh, coming from Buddha Vajradhara or Vajradharma, uh, it has the long lineage, it has a short lineage, and it has the infallible experiences of Naropa. So it means that the final thing is, is that uh, looking at the way that Naropa practiced and his sharing, that then we can say that he, he um, we have that to show that the Vajrayogini Tantra is very, very powerful. So that's the, uh, the first section of the, of the things, the uh, three characteristics and the four qualities. <clears throat> and again, it, it's important to feel a little bit inspired by it, you know. Uh, then there's the qualifications. Uh, you have the three principles of the path. You receive the initiation, you study, uh, you have death, birth, or rebirth. You have a rough and subtle generation stage, and you have the completion stage. So those are the, 
the qualifications for you as, as a student. Now, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the well, let's say, practice and, and what I've seen um, uh, with students. So, for example, uh, you might think that the, the practice of Vajogini is very old, maybe not so relevant to our culture, but it, it is about, you know, having a very good heart in the sense of purity. Uh, I have a, when I did my three-year retreat, there was a, a person there that was doing also a very, very long retreat. And both of us were a little bit involved in sort of a Jungian way of looking at things because it was interesting, but we were both practicing a strong, strong practice of Tantra. So anyway, um, when he started his practice, and it was a long practice, he did it for, I think, up to three years. Uh, and we used to talk a little bit, you know, we, we lived on the same, on the edge of the mountain. We were up above Dharamsal, up above Macleod Ganj, at about 7,000 feet. And, and around us were the, the yogis, uh, Gen Trukdo, Gen Tukdan, uh, Geshe um, Tokdan, uh, the, these ones, these, these, these Geshe's. And sometimes, you know, you think that in the Gilupa, uh, there aren't, you know, they're, we're, they're all, always intellectual, you know, very studies. Well, all of my teachers, we're in retreat. Geshe Rapton, when I met him in 1971, he just come out of a three-year retreat of doing Yamantaka. Uh, all of his students, which were uh, Geshe Gen Tupton, uh, Champa Wangdu, they're all in retreat. These were these were Geshe's who had, and Geshe Rapton was a Geshe Larampa. They were all in retreat. They weren't just in monasteries teaching and things like that, which sometimes is projected on the Gelupa lineage. They were practitioners and Lama Yeshi, incredible practitioner. I heard that when Lama Yeshi was in Baksa, he was all very close with Thangaru Rinpoche. You know, we know as a Kargyupa Lama, very famous, very great, great, great Lama. You know, they were very good friends. And they used to do retreats and meditate together. Now, I don't have the details and maybe I'm misquoting a little bit, but I understood that Lama Yeshi, when he went in retreats uh, around Baksa, that he had his first really powerful spiritual experiences. And I believe it was in conjunction a little bit with Tanga Rinpoche. So anyway, that, so in our lineage, there are great practitioners, the ones that really were, uh, you know, following the practice, living in the mountains. When I met Geshe Rapton, I mean, here he is, he's a Geshe Larampa. He actually became an assistant teacher to the Dalai Lama. He was in the little mud hut. I would swear it was no more than like three meters by two meters and slate roof, mud walls. It was cold and horrible. <laughs> I, I took my, my novice ordination as a monk uh, from him in that room, you know, and yet, you know, here he is, he's, he's a high Geshe, a Geshe Larampa, one of the highest of the, of the Geshe's and, and for the year of his graduation, you know, so incredible. And yet here he was deep in meditation and such. Anyway, my point being is, is that the, 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 the the, the, okay, so I was in retreat. I had a friend who was doing a lot of retreat. And so when he started, he said, uh, it was sort of funny, you know, because we were both practicing. Um, he said, his, he started to dream of, of women, but they were prostitutes. Yeah, okay, well, you know, whatever, you know. Okay, but he's, because he was, he was a monk, you know, he didn't have anything in relation, but the, the women that were sort of slovenly, you know. But anyway, so then he practiced for about six months. And at the six month mark, then he had one, and one of these women that had shown up in his dreams came to him and she was in a Turkish bath, you know, with, with she had the white towel wrapped around her, her chest and things. And she just come out of a steam room and she had a towel around her head. And he thought, oh, interesting, you know. He said, oh, it must be something, you know. And he was working on his bodhicitta, and his, his wisdom understanding. And then uh, again, he continued to practice. You know, as I say, we, we used to talk a little bit. Uh, and things uh, about our dreams and our practices and stuff. You know, I, I lived for, uh, well, three years on that side of the mountain with no contact other than once a week. My, my cook, my fellow that brought me food would come up, give me my food and then run away. <laughs> he didn't want to spend any time with me. And so every six weeks, I would have uh, someone from the village come up and just make sure I was healthy and I wasn't going crazy or anything like that. Anyway, so the, he was one of the people that we would, we would chat with. Anyway, so then, then he, he started to dream uh, of, of a, a girl from his high school 